again, I would like to welcome you in, in the name of uh, Soundwalk September and Walk Lesson Create, now going in its uh, last uh, days, uh, with um, a panel that is the one but last but not least. Uh, to, um, tomorrow we have another uh, a talk uh, with Simona Vermeer about uh, walking with uh, plants. Tonight, uh, Helen is uh, joining us to talk about movement and culture. In, in, in. Uh, first of all, I would like to invite you still to participate to the events that uh, are happening, it will be happening. And uh, it's, we are going into the finale, which means that there will be still uh, lots of movement and music happening, even up till the last day, uh, the 30th of September. Uh, please check out the menu, uh, the program of Soundwalk September. There's many things are happening. There are also two collaborative collective actions, uh, shorelines, which are inviting you to write and to recite on places between water and land. And uh, our 30 days of Soundwalking, you have still two days to go to make a walk and a recording and upload that to our south site to complete our 30 days Soundwalk. Shortlines will continue. You can continue to write and recite after Soundwalk September. Now, uh, Soundwalk September was organized and coordinated together with Babak and Andrew, who are um, tonight with us as well. And um, to start uh, our conversation, um, I would like to ask you to mute yourself if this not this not happened yet. And if you have any remarks, ideas, comments, feedback, through the uh, conversation with or the talk of uh, uh, Helen, to put them in the chat box uh, so we can pick them up in a conversation uh, after. Uh, this is a very open talk. Uh, you are invited to, um, to contribute with all your ideas, uh, with questions, and I hope that the conversation will not only happen between me as a moderator, um, you and uh, Helen, but between yourselves as well. It would be wonderful to know more about you and what you do. First of all, I would like to introduce um, Helen. Uh, Helen is a composer, sound artist and curator based in the southwest of the UK. She's the lead artist for art music, which creates, produces and promotes collaborative, participatory and site-specific artwork, finding inspiration in beauty, statistics, coincidence and the sense of place. Her work embraces theatre, choreography, mapping and field recording. She has always been interested in the physical aspects of music making, particularly the moment when gesture becomes sound. And with art music, formed in 1999, she has uh, continued to collaborate with artists from other disciplines, creating site-specific and interactive work in urban and rural landscapes. Her works include commissions, uh, like for the Sal Salisbury Cathedral, BBC Two, Bath Film Festival, Cork 2005 European Capital of Culture, the Udo Festival in the Netherlands, and Inside Outdoor Set, and her work has been performed in many locations, including the uh, ICA, London, and disused quarry in East Mendip and the remote Dorset Woodland. In 2017, she was invited to take part in the Sura Medura International Artist Residency in Sri Lanka. And in 2019, she curated Listen, a season of sound art at Black Swan Arts in Froome, Somerset, during the summer, working with local, national and international artists and culminating with hosting Soundwalk, then still Soundwalk, someday in the West Country, uh, where we had our overture uh, with various events, including a performative silent walk by myself and three great dancers, and with a panel uh, together with Andrew and other um, eminent uh, experts and artists. And today we almost at least close with Helen. So Helen, up to you. Thank you, Gert. Um I've had several opportunities to talk about my work in the last two years. Being outside of academic and educational institutions, this has been quite a new experience um, and provides welcome opportunity refl for reflection. 
These opportunities to talk have provided a welcome opportunity for reflection and a chance to make different kinds of senses and narratives of my work and practice. I suggested this subject of movement in the participation and experience of art for this cafe because movement of different kinds has always been an important feature of my work. Thinking about this presentation over recent weeks and days, I found connections and threads around movement that I hadn't anticipated or had forgotten about. This process of remembering and reflecting has been very useful in thinking about my current practice, so I'd like to thank Walk, Listen, Create very much for this opportunity. My plan is to tell you a number of stories about the relationship between music and movement and art from my working life over the last four decades. I'll talk mostly like this, face to face, and huge apologies for reading my presentation. If I don't do that, I'm likely to miss bits out, so please bear with me. I will also occasionally share my screen. For the first story, there are some pictures. So this is about dance and chance. In 1980, I was lucky enough to meet and work with John Cage. I had just finished a music degree at Goldsmiths. It was a time when the Laban Centre was based immediately behind the main Goldsmiths building in New Cross. Bonnie Bird, then the principal lecturer at Laban, is known for having brought Merce Cunningham and John Cage together at Cornish College of the Arts in 1930, in the 1930s. Sorry. She arranged for the choreographer and composer to be invited to visit Goldsmiths and run a week of workshops and performances with young musicians and dancers. The dancers worked with Cunningham and we, the musicians, had a week listening to, talking with and playing with and for John Cage. One of the workshops involved each of us creating a solo piece of work, making our own score using chance procedures. We had to decide our medium and material before we could start to devise a score. I decided that I didn't want to use a traditional musical instrument and chose a staging block amplified with a contact mic and a selection of my shoes as my instrument. I used chance to decide which shoes I wore and whether I stamped, <laughs> ran or walked on the block. Oh, <laughs> It was my first piece of what might be called conceptual art, years before I wrote any conventional music. I can't remember how I arrived at the stage block and the shoes, but I suppose I was influenced by all the dance going on around me. In a way, without any context or knowledge, this was an early walking piece, perhaps, long before I had come across the idea of sound walks or walking artists. This encounter with John Cage and a second a few years later gave me so much, not necessarily the things that people talk about when citing Cage's influence, but a kind of confidence to just do, and a faith in coincidence and accident as generators of work and shapers of life. He was the most generous, warm and kind man imaginable, with a wicked laugh, very infectious and very funny. Coincidence also comes into my second story, which is about gesture and, and theatricality. Throughout the 1980s, I often worked as a musician in experimental theatre productions, and I spent a lot of time with my musician and theatre friends at the ICA, performing or hanging around in the bar. One afternoon, the theatre's director approached a group of us and said there was a space in the calendar and would we be interested in filling it? You imagine that happening now. Anyway, around the table were three composers, Simon Rackham, Lawrence Crane and Jocelyn Pook, singer Melanie Pappenheim and me. Not being able to turn down such an opportunity, that afternoon we formed the composing and performing group three or four composers. I think that not having really entered the world of composition yet, I was the all four. Over the next 12 years or so, we worked together with visual artists, dancers and other musicians, creating a series of increasingly theatrical performances. We were interested in gesture and movement in musical performance. 
and our performances involve the moving of props, people and sound around a stage or found space. Some of the pieces of movement serve to create pictures for the audience. A butterfly created by my hands on the piano keys, a hat mysteriously moving over the heads of the audience, or a whole room of floating furniture conjuring up a flooded scene. I'd like to play you an extract from our trilogy of installations about the drowned church bells of Dunwich. This is part of my piece Storm Bells from the animated installation Still Ringing, performed by three or four composers with music students from Nottingham Trent University in a banana warehouse in Nottingham in 1995. You may well spot the influence of the experimental theatre and dance of the 1980s. The extract is nearly four minutes long and a bit dark, so imagine yourself in a draughty and dimly lit warehouse. So in 1996, my partner 
three-year-old daughter and I moved from London to Froome in Somerset. I always thrive on collaborating and I was still at this time working on projects with three or four composers. But interestingly, most of the people I met in the first year or so living in Froome were visual artists. At an evening meeting of local painters and sculptors, I met artists with whom I embarked on new collaborations. As a result of this new turn in my working life, I applied for a grant from the Arts Council. This was to fund two collaborative projects in Froome and led to the establishment of our small arts organisation, Art Music. One of these projects was set up to try to free visual art from what we christened Museum Walk. We felt that the act of walking around a gallery promoted a kind of tired trudging that wasn't conducive to full appreciation of the artworks. We wanted to devise a means by which people could engage with visual stimuli in a more active way. Sound designer Alistair Gordon suggested we make a piece involving visual and sound elements using Soundbeam, a system through which sounds can be triggered by the breaking of ultrasonic beams. This piece, Footprints, was the first in a series of six movement-generated works using Soundbeam, made between 1999 and 2015. Some of the work of this kind involved visual elements, but some took the form of interactions between the public and a building. In both cases, we thought of the visitors to the space as actively involved in what we called public choreography. I'd like to show you a short extract of one of these pieces. This is Thin Air, a sound sculpture designed for cathedrals and large religious buildings. The film shows the piece installed in Southall Minster, and this extract is about two and a half minutes long. evidence showed that we did often succeed in giving people a moving experience through movement. The Dean of St Finbar's Cathedral in Cork, where we installed thin air in 2005, said that by moving around the space in order to create sound and music, he found himself viewing the interior of the cathedral, which, which he was very familiar with, in a totally new light. In the late noughties, art music started working outside, creating site-specific installations and promenade performances where both the performers and the audience moved. We had already devised indoor work in which where you are and where you move will determine what you hear and see. Outdoors, this happened on a larger scale and involved more working, sorry, this involved more walking on the part of everyone. Palace intrusions took place around the moat and inside the gardens of the Bishop's Palace in Wales, with different invited, with different invited artists making mostly movement orientated work each month. The City Sings was commissioned to celebrate the reopening of the Arts Centre MAC, 
and took place across the city of Birmingham, involving numbers of sites and journeys. Ring Ring Bell was a soundscape made up of bell sounds collected from along the A11 in London, from Aldgate to Bow. Finally, our reworking of an earlier soundbeam piece, Lacrimae, required the audience to venture into the woods to find sculpture and sound. In 2016, Art Music's work moved into the realm of geolocated sound when Inside Out Dorset, one of the hosts of the, of the outdoor lacrime, invited us to work with Satsymph on a virtual version of the piece. As a result of that collaboration, you can still experience lacrime by visiting Chapel Coppice in Ashley Chase near Abbotsbury with your smartphone and the Satsymph app. Last year, as Heert said, as curator of Listen, I invited Satsymph to create a new geolocated sound walk through reworking oral histories recorded by local group Home in Froome. We concluded Listen by hosting Sound Walk Sunday in Froome. Heert led his silent utopia walk around the town and he and Andrew joined us for a symposium about sound walking. My stories so far have described various ways in which movement has been part of the performance or the mode of experiencing artworks, and latterly the artwork itself. You can make a theory fit a set of circumstances, can't you? And that I have chosen to look at periods of my work in terms of movement might be viewed as a little contrived. But I do believe that movement is the key. Einstein said, nothing happens until something moves. And I can think of numerous occasions when I would find someone standing at the edge of one of our installations, waiting for something to happen. And I would have to say, nothing will happen until you move. And to refer briefly to the emotional meaning of the word, I have also witnessed on many occasions the total transformation of body and spirit as someone discovers that their movement around the space is causing the sounds they are hearing. They are suddenly dancing. Now, as we begin the 2020s, I find I've had loads of material and methodology at my disposal. When I look back over the last 40 years, I can see, or at least imagine, some kind of progression. My parents both died in the last decade, and I find myself in a more reflective mood. My next major project will be a requiem, part performance, part installation, part walk. Sadly, the number of people and things there are to mourn the loss of grows all the time. Something that's happened over the last year, and particularly in lockdown, is that I've formed a connection with a literary circle, A Leap in the Dark. And I have Melanie Pappenheim to thank for this, because she took me along to perform in a live event in Paddington in February. It was the thing that began A Leap in the Dark. It was on the 29th of February, the Leap Day. Um, and it was an extraordinary event with a lot of extraordinary people who I now count as my friends, which is wonderful, because we've been doing the same thing online all during lockdown. And I've also developed relationships with several individual writers. So words, words, I think, are my new collaboration. Words have also been involved with my association with Walk, Listen, Create and Sound Walk September. My last little story involves a poem. When deciding on a walk to record for Sound Walk Sunday's 30 Days of Walking, I noticed that opposite the proposed date of my walk in my Redstone diary was an ex extract from a poem about walking by Antonio Machado. Letting coincidence again take the lead, I took the extract with me to Glastonbury and made a short audio walk inspired by the poem and using the line, the path is made by walking, as my title. The extract goes like this. Wanderer, your footprints are the path. And nothing else. Wanderer, there is no path. The path is made by walking. As chance would have it, these words rather fell into my lap. But I think they say it all. My use of this poem by an author I'm ashamed to say I did not previously know, prompted my friend and writer John Payne 
to send me a piece that he had written about Machado some years ago. So in the spirit of collaboration and conversation, I'd like to pass the baton on and ask John to read his poem. Helen has mentioned this poem, the path being created by your own footsteps. There's a lot in Machado of relevance to sound walkers like time, water, even music. I have lived with Machado and his writing for half a century now, but what I want to do tonight is to read my own poem about his death in the final days of the Spanish War of 1936-39. I think this reminds us that there are other walking issues the walks that women and men and children are forced to go on, the forced walks, especially refugees. Beyond the virus, beyond Brexit, there are always the refugees. <coughs> My poet, Antonio Machado, born in Seville, Spain, 1875, died Collioure, France, 1939. The first draft of this poem was sketched in pencil on the day of the World Trade Center bombings, 11th of September, 2001. But composed in my head the night before, I cannot explain that. Later, it became a prose piece published in the London magazine. Now it is a poem once more, and it keeps changing like the view on any walk. Machado was committed to change and renewal, and I think he would have approved of what I'm doing here. The village of Porbo, a minor road, a railway line, twist and turn along the rocky coast. Now few pass this way, except in homage to a poet. Dangerously beautiful, this coast where France meets Spain, both dangerous and beautiful, the border of two proud nations, and yet belonging to neither, for this is Catalonia, a third proud nation. In the new borderless Europe, the French fishing ports just a few miles up the coast, Collier, for example, are good spots for pre-dinner drinks across the now unguarded border, this border that once mattered so much. Tell me how you die and I will tell you who you are. A proverb. In 1939, the Spanish poet Antonio Machado passed this way. He wrote, it matters a lot whether in this short and brutish life we lead, freedom or slavery is our fate. But if we are to return to our mother the sea, it makes no difference to me. You wrote that, Don Antonio, on a winter's day, perhaps much like the day of your own death, cold, wet, huddled, dark. These, those were the words you used in Spain, refugee words. 27 years later, you were dead, a refugee in France. The poet made his choice because of that. He died that most common of modern deaths the death of exile, fleeing across the border. A death like that of many others, it must be said, in our short and brutish 20th century. The poet now honored by a stone slab in a cemetery close to the railway at Kanyur. People, pilgrims maybe, still come to visit him. Plastic red roses of former times, giving way to the kitsch of dolls and verses handfuls of Spanish gravel and photos, and always dying flowers. I have friends of Porbo astride the border, the Pyrenees descending to the sea. It is in little places like Porbo that the guilty states of the modern world erected their barriers, paraded up and down, wearing the uniforms of the short and brutish 20th century. It was the parading up and down that was the worse. Porbo from the sea, a village of white cubes as the sun retreats behind the Catalan mountains, French, Spanish, who cares? The old boat grumbling quietly back into harbor, 
a greying lawyer at the wheel, his son-in-law. I have known him since he was a little boy, granddaughter, myself, the English writer, still damp from our evening swim in the cool waters beneath the steepening cliffs. A boat built for fishing in 1931, requisitioned, such a 20th century word for Coast Guard duty by the Republic, abandoned on a rocky beach down the coast, like you, the poet abandoned in your refugee camp a few miles up the coast, and now a pleasure boat, a pleasure boat, a pleasure boat. It matters a lot whether we live free or enslaved, but if we are to return to our mother, the sea, then it makes no difference to me. That, at any rate, is what you wrote, Don Antonio, in Baeza, a cold, wet, jumbled city on the borders of La Mancha and Andalusia, 27 years before you, 27 years before your death. You, who lost everything, but left us your poetry. Thank you for listening. Thank you about... John and Helen, beautiful to give the voice to a poet and to start from there in a movement that this conversation will become, I hope. Uh, uh, if there are any like feedback comments you would like to share with Helen or with John, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, and um, um, maybe I can start with the first uh, uh, thought. Um, and just like I said, as you may not have heard, uh, um, I think it's very beautiful to uh, give to pass this movement from music towards uh, poetry and give a voice to to a poet. Um, actually, I as a poet, uh, my background is actually poetry. At a certain age, when I was quite uh, young, um, I started to study music to become to become a better poet, and eventually, I ended up walking which combined both uh, for me because i see walking as a form of writing uh, writing with your body and at the same time i see it as a very the um, sonoric uh, sensorial but but in the first place a very sonoric event by by walking even in silent walks as i do a lot uh, you everything is about hearing uh, your own steps and um, uh, that is what i um, uh, admire in your work as well helen how to combine this or, or triggering the sound to uh, footsteps or the, 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 the steps itself as part of, of, the, of, the, of the musical composition. And um, how did you, my, my, my first question would be, how did you come to this um, uh, approach of uh, involving walking in your musical practice? Mm -hmm. In the meantime, John, maybe you can, can uh, come back to you for a moment while we are waiting for, for Helen. <laughs> so, so uh, and, uh, a poet always has a voice, so I'm not doubting that he will hear you. Um, uh, uh, could you tell something about your collaboration with Helen? Uh, when did it start and what did you do uh, together with her? Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly haven't uh, ever walked together. We do s swim together and we um, talk as we swim and we watch how our movements on the water change the pattern of light and create the most wonderful pattern on the alders and the willows above us and it's a very regular it's, it's a very regular progression um we're moving we're moving and it's past present and future but then suddenly the kingfisher will come into it and of course the kingfisher as we experience kingfishers certainly when you're in the river it's it's very very sudden and very immediate and it's a sort of um stab across the direction that you're actually moving and one of the things that interests me i think is is those sudden 
things that happen in time which which happen just for a tiny tiny moment and don't seem to fit in with that general progression and I sometimes wonder if death is going to be like that that you're um, dying which is a progressive activity but then at a particular moment you actually do stop breathing and your brain closes down and uh, so lots and lots of um, thoughts but um, I've always been fascinated by the sorts of things that uh, Helen does and I'm very disappointed that um, Richard White from Bath is not here tonight um, he took part in the seminar room last summer and he and I are still walking together even through lockdown um, mm -hmm. we are doing something called slow walking we have a burial ground where 3,000 bodies are buried of people who died in the Bath workhouse their only crime was poverty simply being poor and they're buried there there's no memorial there's no markers and what we're doing every first Sunday of the month for several hours is walking very very slowly across this relatively small piece of land and reading out the names of the people who died it begins at about 1858 and it goes through to 1899 and I think we've got as far as 1877 at the moment and the last Sunday the first Sunday in September we had some music we had some folk musicians came and um, played and there was something wonderful about that because I don't suppose anybody had actually played music in that particular place and I was sitting on the ground at one point and feeling the music through the ground and those 3,000 bodies all buried underneath it. So uh, it's a very complex business. I mean, I'm sorry that it has taken me a long time to discover all this because I feel it's a sort of, you know, it's such a very, very rich vein. But at any rate, um, Richard White has a website, which I think is called Walk Now, or one word. and um, if you wanted to know more about that particular bit of work that would be the place to find out more about it i'm hoping that helen is back with us now uh, i do have a question if i may uh, and i will speak uh, slowly in the hope that helen will hear me because indeed i can see that uh, she's the only one with a bad connection in the room um, First of all, thanks, John, for your poem. I thought it was awesome. Uh, also, because you connect, you for me now connect the events in Bath with a face, because I of course see all events coming along on the Walk, Listen, Create website, but I'm very bad at remembering names. And now I realize that it is you who put up uh, uh, the listing of the events in Bath. Um, now, on your poem, your poem very clearly has a strong to me, political connection, right? You connect uh, the um, uh, Spanish Civil War with uh, the events on 9-11 um, and then with the current refugee crisis. Uh, and that makes me wonder about Helen's work. Helen, uh, can you do, is, do you see a political component to your work? And if you do, can you tell us a little bit about it? Um. So while we are waiting for Helen to come back, it's all about walking, it seems. So then um, um, uh, with the one, one element that was uh, raised by, by John was that walking seems to provoke a certain slowness. It, it, perverts, it provokes in the first place, that, in my opinion, and then a, a deeper listening um, to what is around you. Uh, the, uh, you start to listen with your whole body, like Pauline Oliveira said, that you actually you're listening with the uh, soles of your feet while walking. Um, it, um, it, it, it always, it seems to invite people to a certain stillness, which, which you would uh, um, expect to be the opposite of, of, of movement. 
And um, uh, uh, Drif, uh, could I ask you um, how this um, happens in your work? <laughs> well, yes. Uh, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, yes. great. Yeah. No, that, that Pauline Oliveros piece is beautiful. It's take a walk at night, walk mm -hmm. so softly that your feet become ears. And yes. uh, that's something that, that I'm very interested in, that kind of meditative um, listening through walking very, very slowly. Because I think there's something about walking very slowly um, that, that is sort of quite transformative in a way. Um, you know, I'm someone who walks very quickly normally <laughs> and is quite impatient to get somewhere. So in the sound walks I lead, um, I often very deliberately, the, the, you know, find a way that people don't really know where they're walking. They're just following their feet, letting their feet guide them. And, you know, if you do that, your feet do guide you <laughs> if you kind of keep your, your mind out of it. And that thing of just going very slowly and just drifting without having an aim, um, I, I feel is very restorative. I mean, there's a lot more I can say, but I, I, I don't want to take over. <laughs> I think that's probably enough. <laughs> don't, uh, don't worry. And, uh, if, and that, that the sort of um, yeah, uh, goes into what uh, Babak was suggesting. I think the political uh, the, the dimension of uh, this sort of work is actually transformative. That uh, every walk is and the walking is not passive, it's active. It is every step is transforming what is around you. Um, even if it is on a very subtle or poetic way, um, walking is never consuming. It's, it's maybe the last thing that is not consuming anymore on this uh, on this planet. And uh, that's what's bringing very close to music. For me, walking was always uh, extremely musical by its being in the moment, by not having, uh, by having a direction, but not having um, <laughs> Um, a defined end or beginning. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's a flow. Uh, it being in a flow. And um, uh, John, did you want to say something? Okay. Yes, I found um, um, Vivian's comments extremely helpful. Um, one of the things I haven't admitted so far is that I do have a disability, and um, in fact, swimming for me is much easier than um, walking. I can't do. Um, very much more than slow walking. And the lovely thing is that I work with Richard White in that. Now, Richard is the kind of person who thinks of a walk as 25 to 30 miles at a time. And it's lovely actually doing it with Richard in this very slow and very deliberate way. And, and it is um, quite a new feeling for me. And I've think, although I can't obviously speak for Richard, I think it's probably a new thing for him too. But um, but it is a sort of issue that sometimes you think all this walking, well, you know, it's okay for you guys who are sort of A1 health and reasonably young and fit. But for some of us, walking is actually an issue. It's something we have to be extremely careful about. The other thing I wanted to mention was this book. I'm not sure if anybody else has come across the Book of Trespass by Nick Hayes. Um, the subtitle is Crossing the Lines That Divide Us. It's an extraordinary book. I've nearly got to the end. But Nick did a presentation for us on Zoom at the local bookshop. And we had a very, very entertaining evening with this. But uh, it is fairly extraordinary. But he's he's another person who is always, you know, leaping over walls and climbing through barbed wire fences and all <laughs> the sorts of things that I did as a boy. But I would actually no longer be capable of at all. So whether walking um, involves actually going through those kinds of borders that people set up to keep us out. I mean, the, the figures for the ownership of land in this country, I mean, by this country, I mean England specifically, are quite horrific. 
it's rather better, you'll be pleased to hear, in Scotland, but uh, it's a bit of a disaster uh, in England. So what Nick has been doing is actually specifically making a point of trespassing on private land, because of course all this private land hasn't always been private land. It was once public land, it was the commons, it was part of where people were, like the water and the air. Uh, my name's Barry Cooper, <laughs> and I'm a visual artist. I've collaborated with Helen and many other um, mu uh, composers and musicians. Um, uh, I'd like to go back to um, uh, to Beethoven, actually, uh, and and many of the Romantic composers who actually, um, uh, as it is for me, walking is um, is an essential part of of composition um, because um, uh, it's a way of relaxing. Um, uh, it's rhythm. It's it's all those things and. Um, uh, I, uh, and uh, I suppose I bring it into my own work with my painting um, because I work from um, uh, from composers' music and I and I often dance to them as well when I'm doing it or or uh, there's a lot of moments um, movements in it um, and also I've collaborated with. Um, uh, um, actually, with live performance with um, a Froom, um, an international jazz musician, John Law. So, um, uh, where we we actually performed on stage with me with a canvas, um, empty canvas to begin with, and and John Law improvising. So, um, I think movement for me and 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 for many artists um, uh, and particularly walking um, is essential is absolutely essential because it's um, it's an activity you do you can do which doesn't cost any money um, and um, uh, yeah um, right I've had my say I think that's enough um, and um, yeah but I have um, uh, I also share John's um, political commitment too, because all all my work is is um, politically motivated. I think. Yeah, to, to come on your um, uh, the, what you say about walking is an essential is uh, a form of uh, communicating, talking, um, but a bit another. Uh, reminds me about how actually the ancient Greeks were. Um, seeing while walking. Uh, for them, uh, they could not separate uh, walking with having a conversation and they suddenly could decide in the middle of the uh, ancient Agora, or a group of people could decide in the, uh, the middle of the ancient Agora in, in, in Athens to go to Piraeus, which is like uh, six miles away, and um, to uh, walk there together, not because the, the and to visit a friend that they may have there and uh, uh, walk for hours and hours, not for the walking, but just for the pleasure of the conversation, because they were seeing uh, seeing conversing as something in the, in the movement, not sitting around the table as well. But that then they were drinking and uh, and they were like more interested in the drinking than in the talking. But uh, in the walking, the talking itself, the whole philosophy philosophical. Um, the um, uh, approach to um, uh, to walking came from the Greeks and the conversations. The whole philosophy of Greece is is, is one big dialogue between people. So and that happened walking. So um, and Beethoven's uh, yes, Beethoven's booklet is is of course uh, uh, the, the wonderful illustration for that. We still have his booklets, and because Beethoven was, as many of you may know. He was not very uh, uh, well hearing, so uh, he was uh, expecting his uh, partners in walking in the conversations to write down their uh, questions or their answers into uh, a little booklet. And he was, of course, talking, um, but they were uh, uh, writing down their questions while they were making very long walks in the forest. Um, so um, next to 
the communicative part uh, of working, you have also the participative part of working. By working together, you perceive in a different way. Uh, you uh, you see things that you will not see other ways uh, uh, because you um, you are much more present in the, in the landscape and discuss about things that you see around you. And, um, <laughs> yeah. I'd like to um, to add something when you, when you mentioned uh, the Greeks because. Um, uh, I spent quite a bit since 1998, quite uh, a bit of my working life in Greece, and I love the Greeks, and I love their their um, belief in movement, um, and uh, particularly dance. Of course, I mean uh, the definition of a Greek is a, is um, is dance, um, through, uh, most most famously illustrated by Zorba the Greek, and. Um, uh, yeah, I, um, I think I think to go back to the Greeks it was it was a brilliant statement. <laughs> yeah. Yes. If I don't know if Zorba the Greek uh, Zorba the Greek will love to hear that you call him a Greek because <laughs> he was from Greek. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Are you Greek? And, uh, I'm uh, let's say g g half Greek in my heart. Uh, let's, uh, <laughs> ah yes, well and me and me. <laughs> yes. yes. Mm. yes. Rika no, is laughing behind her hand because we do have a Greek in our midst. Midst um, ah. uh, might have uh, some uh, things to say about walking uh, as well, uh, but also uh, in a political context. Good, good, good. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. So yeah. that was very inspiring. The whole conversation and the. I really am a bit speechless because both you and uh, John Payne made uh, really full of feelings li listening to you. Um, but I don't feel ready to comment. It, great work. I would love to see more from both of you and uh, the, all the sites that I have already opened and I wait to, the, to finish the conversation and uh, see more about it. Um, so to go back with uh, working as a political act, yes, we do a lot of things with a group of uh, other artists and architects here in Greece that have to do with historical memory, slow walks into very, very um, remote places in mountain areas in Greece for a project that we do and talk about things, talk about uh, wounds that remain unsaid in the Greek history, like the Civil War. It's a process that uh, needs a lot of time. Slow walk really helps. And I love the way that Vivienne, I, th I think, said, walking without um, just wandering, even getting a bit lost uh, in a field that is very, very, um, how can I say, um, um, has a lot of memories, layers of memories, of historical memories of various periods and uh, unsolved problems. Um, as for the peripatetic, uh, peripatetic history that Gert mentioned, well, I'm not quite sure that it was just the Greeks that have uh, <laughs> invented philosophy and working together. Maybe it's just an urban legend or a myth or something. Of course, they did. Uh, it's said that they were walking and talking and philosophing a lot, but uh, I suppose that this is all around the world the same. People, I mean, the song lines of the Aboriginals and so many other stories around the world that uh, it's exactly the same, almost the same. But of course, it's emblematic to talk about Aristoteles, but uh, it's. Maybe they were not even the first ones to do it. Who knows? <laughs> we don't have that much evidence. <laughs> but still, it's um, it's a way of solving things. I suppose that they used it a lot, walking around gardens and talking. At least we we love thinking about them this way, which makes the same, I suppose. We create our own version of the ancient Greek history, <laughs> which is maybe, I don't know, so if it's so accurate, but still, 
maybe it's inspiring. Uh, one thing I remember about our, um, our meeting in Prespes, uh, Rika, was that we actually took part in a walking choir yes. Yes, and singing, which is a tradition I didn't know that uh, that actually you can have choirs that walk and sing at the same time. Yes, hmm. especially in the north. Melanie, may I ask you something? Can you tell something about your work, the work you did with uh, Helen? As she mentioned to you. In the Yes, um, we've worked together for well since 1980. I remember now. We did at the one of the earliest performances we did together was at the ICA in central London, and it was um, on the 19th of November 91. It was a palindromic date, and um, so we made a piece of music theatre which was uh, considered of entirely palindromic music um three of it was for three or four composers and helen uh, and it was it was staged in a palindromic fashion as well so um for instance um i had various pieces to sing it was called a man a plan a canal panama which um you may know is a famous english palindrome and so the piece was about ferdinand de lesseps who built the suez canal was the architect of the suez canal but then went on to um, just went on to a disaster really, which was the Panama Canal, where many people died, um, mostly Chinese migrant workers died in the construction of that canal, or the lack of construction of it. Anyway, um, in the middle of this piece, um, I sang forwards um, a sort of lament about this uh, yellow fever psalm it was called, and then there was a big gong struck, and then that gong sound was then played backwards and then the whole of the second half of the piece was backwards. So I learned to sing backwards um, for that pr production, <laughs> which is something I've carried on doing since actually. So um, all these works that we did became very influential and, and that backwards singing, I've, I've sung on lots of film scores um, <laughs> using that technique and um, it's, it's proved very fruitful. Um, and so I suppose with all the work with the various composers, I think I was the awe <laughs> for composer, actually. I'm surprised Helen said she was, because to my mind, she was definitely an established composer at that time. So I was a bit surprised to hear her make that claim. So I think I was, as the singer, I was the person that actually didn't really compose that much, but I improvised a lot. Um, I remember Helen's uh, wrote a very um, wrote some wonderful piano music for that piece, um, and everything I've ever done with Helen has featured something, some extraordinary visual component. In fact, earlier today I was describing a piece we did at the Festival Hall where um, a, a visual artist made a dress for a grand piano, and Helen was part of the dress for the piano. So the piano and Helen were sort of one. <laughs> beautiful item. It's a little bit like a Christo, um, if you know the work of Christo. So she she was sort of one object um, in the foyer of the Festival Hall playing some beautiful music uh, that, on that occasion. So um, yeah, everything I've done with Helen has involved a very strong visual and therefore a physical component. I mean, usually it starts that way around for me. So with Helen, she'll write music there'll be a visual component and then the physicality grows out of that combination really. Um, and we did a piece at Sherborne Abbey last summer with her musical box and that involved a lot of walking actually as it turned out which surprised me but that grew out of the piece it seemed to be intrinsic to the to her music so <laughs> I think she can't escape it. It's pulse isn't it? Pulse and then intervals what do you do in an interval as a performer rather than just stand there it's quite nice to um, um, find other modes of being like you saw in the film at the beginning with the young people leaping across the space doing that hopscotch movement which is it's very beautiful it's a bit like what John was saying about the kingfisher you know you're watching yeah. a friend and it's very still and you get some slow movement suddenly you see someone <laughs> hopscotching I don't know if you're familiar with that um, that game, Gert, and blah, blah, you know, that's a, it's a children's sort of nursery playground game. But anyway, just to see the people 
doing that funny quirky leaping movement um, across that space was surprising and brought a different rhythm that wasn't actually musical it's a physical thing and just added another whole dimension to the, the piece um, that was actually a Dutch choreographer who, who made that who made that work who um, uh, Tom Stewart who I again have forgotten about it was very nice to see that work again it's such a shame Helen can't speak <laughs> But her music speaks for her, so I've said enough, I think. I have a question, um, mm -hmm. if I may. Yes, uh, please. Sort of yeah. for, yeah. Uh, it's sort of for anyone and everyone, and I think it's probably unanswerable, but um, uh, yes. just some context, I, um, I play early music, and I was a so-called mature student at Trinity Laban shortly after they had joined the music and the dance and I had some ideas about research that overlapped and I don't know I had a few ideas and they weren't really quite ready for me I think but but um, one of them was about um, on the musical end uh, metaphors um, let's say a conductor or a teacher someone is trying to communicate an emotional quality to some very good student musicians and you know how do they speak about it and I found that well I didn't get all the way through this study but I found that there were a lot of um, movement metaphors unsurprisingly you know this is a waterfall or or you know here's where you step on the moving walkway already moved, or you know there were all kinds of um, images like that but so the question is as I say I think it's unanswerable but each of you in your fields, uh, painting, uh, writing, music, um, when you're responding to one of the other, something that someone has done in one of the other fields, how do you, um, you know, are you responding generally to the emotional content? Are you responding to movements? Is there an equivalent of up and down or bright and dark? Is there, are you making a metaphor or are you doing something else? And I'm sure the answer varies with each work, but I just thought I'd sort of throw out the question that encompasses, you know, the whole world. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a very, very interesting question because um, I work directly with musicians or from music. Um, I have no idea how I'm responding. Um, uh, and the nearest I can get to it is by imagining that I'm in in CERN in that um, immense nuclear um, racetrack, and um, what they're looking for at the photographic plate when they meet is accidents, and that's what I'm looking for um, when I'm working from the music. I'm looking for marks I've never made before, and every mark is individual. Like um, yeah, I said, um, I'm actually I'm a, I'm a poet uh, that got lost, uh, literally. That's uh, what I lost <laughs> much about uh, walking. And uh, I um, um, I studied some um, some years uh, with Sergio Chilibidake. He's uh, I know he's quite controversial, uh, <laughs> but uh, he um, um, he loved to mention that uh, he was seeing. Um, Conducting or playing or, or even composing a piece um, uh, was like a walk in a landscape um, where you gradually, from the beginning on, are walking uphill uh, till you come at a point where you feel that that is the highest point, the culminating point. And then you go back, but you don't go back forward, you go back backwards. You go back, back backwards to where you began, and that is the end. And um, I always like this metaphor uh, of uh, of movement. That actually movement is always circular, never linear, um, yes. and that's always a sort of end where you came from. Um, and that makes the I think the musical experience so unique uh, because it's in the moment. And I, I teach some time at um, um, School of Fine Arts in Brussels. Um, uh, actually, very not long because um, I was invited by the new director who was a dancer in Belgium. There was an, there was some for a period um, the, 
tendency to invite uh, people from choreography um, because it's said that Belgium is for choreography what is Brazil for football uh, for, and uh, for soccer and they were invited to develop as well to to like curate exhibitions and the new director of the uh, School of Fine Arts was actually a choreographer it was an experiment how a choreographer will manage a school full of fine and visual artists uh, this experiment lasted six months uh, and then it unfortunately it shattered but uh, his idea was to bring me in uh, to give uh, courses of walking to both to dancers and to um, um, uh, to visual artists and to let them collaborate on that way to finding uh, ways of movement that they can share both um, uh, it um, it led to some fantastic months uh, uh, but unfortunately the management uh, did not like it very much it was i think too innovative like you said as well uh, asha uh, uh, sometimes people are not ready for it and uh, <laughs> it didn't work really out. may i point out that it appears that helen has joined us with a working video connection and a good uh, bandwidth yeah, uh, but I would like to at least go back to when I asked my question, Helen, um, which was about yes. whether you see a political component to your own work, and if you do, what is it? A political component? Um, to be honest, not until recently, until I have been contemplating writing this requiem. Um, and and at this point everything everything seems political um from and and as soon as you start thinking about things you've lost whether individually or as a society it kind of can't help being political but i think before that i think probably not is that does that answer yeah, no, your yeah. question yeah, totally. But it also opens up a new question. That is, uh, yeah. how do you see the political uh, in connection to the requiem that you're writing? Well, I don't really know yet, is the answer. That sounds like a bit of a sidestep. Um, it's, I think it's only, I mean, I've, I've often thought about activism through art. And I know artists who whose work is very activist and has a very strong political dimension. But I, so far, I've never been one of those artists and I don't know. It's not because I'm not political. Um, it's just because the, the work and the politics have never kind of coincided. So I think it's quite a steep learning curve for me to to think of my work as political at all. Um, so I think it's a question of watch this space, especially, and especially for me. <laughs> uh, I would say, Helen, that um, the fact that your work mostly takes place in public spaces and is therefore free <laughs> uh, gives it a political gives it a political dimension. Actually, well, I suppose so. Yes, but isn't it also Helen something to do with having the courage to actually go off and do something entirely different to what you've done in the past i mean to to actually find new ways of expression and new words and new musical notes and new ways of arranging the notes i don't know i mean i'm not a musician but um but i mean it does seem to me that sort of as a, a writer you're there's always a certain pressure to do the same thing again, that because you published a book and it's been reasonably successful, then somebody says, oh, why don't you do something similar? And, and I think um, novelists in particular have the same problem. They keep on writing the same novel, but with a slightly different plot and slightly different characters. And, and uh, But I, I mean, it sounds to me as if what you're talking about in the Requiem is quite a a new leap for you or is that an exaggeration I think, yes i think it is but i think i've made quite a lot of new leaps and and i've i've enjoyed i've enjoyed sort of jumping into new situations where i'm completely forced 
to think of new ways. I mean, an example was when I went to Sri Lanka. Um, I don't think before that I'd ever written a piece where I didn't write it at the piano. And suddenly I was in a place where I didn't have a piano. So I took a kind of little substitute piano with me. I took a little musical box mechanism. And working with that, with that hand-punched strips of paper and, and working with a musical box has, has given me a whole different um, whole different dimension, a whole different way of working, which actually is quite visual. And, and so I, I think I'm now much more likely to look for, for ways that things could be done differently and, and much more likely to put myself in the way of new challenges. Mm. Mm. If that could you say something? Sense. Yeah, could you say something about your white storks piece? Because um, the process of becoming involved with that group down in Sussex who are doing rewilding—I mean, in terms of um, climate cr crisis and that kind of politics—I mean, that seems to me to be a step towards politics again. Oh, I, su I suppose it is. I suppose it is. Um, and I'm all in favour of rewilding. Uh, but that's a kind of funny circular thing as well, because um, Rowena, who is the artist I worked on Footprints with, that very first movement orientated piece, is the mother of Charlie Burrell, who lives at NEP and runs the rewilding project with his wife, Isabella. Um, so I kind of I knew a little bit about what was going on there before I read Isabella's book. And and then another coincidence, I'd met Andrew Bernardi, who is the leader of Shipley Festival, um, because he had saved the day for another project I was working on when we needed a string quartet at the last minute. Um, so there were a lot of coincidences around that we had got on really well and he wanted to work for us to work together again so he decided to commission me but i already knew all about um the rewilding project and a little bit about the white storks so um so yes that was a kind of dream really he invited me to write a piece about the fact that white storks were being bred again in this country or were, were breeding again in this country after a gap of 600 years. Um, and so I got to do this lovely project during during lockdown, which was um, I felt like it was quite cheeky in a way because so many people were having such a terrible time. And I'd been given this lovely project to do. Good evening, everyone. Could I ask one question? <laughs> Once we started to speak about storks and rewilding, could you please share what are your experiences walking in nature and in forest, especially? Uh, I'm working on health benefits walking in nature, and we are trying as scientists to understand what is happening in our brains and in our bodies and in our souls. So I would like to hear your experiences, how this nature and forest settings are affecting you and is there special about nature sounds, that how do you use it in your work and can you feel some healing or therapeutic effects from, from walks in the forest and nature or it's, it can be experienced in similar way in the city? This very grey environment, yeah, surrounded by buildings or in churches. So, would like really to hear how you feel about it. Thank you. Um, well, I feel I feel very inspired by trees. Um, so, walking in a forest um, is a very powerful experience, and at the same time, you're in the air so there's something as well about breathing when you're when you're outdoors in nature which goes along with the walking and your breathing and your walking become a kind of internal rhythm that i think is very calming so yes definitely very therapeutic 
Um, in the city, I don't know. It depends on your motivation. If you're rushing to get from one place to another, then that's different. But I do enjoy walking in urban settings as well. Um, yes, I think, I mean, I think being being outdoors just in itself is is a wonderful therapeutic thing. I don't know that I have very much more to say about that apart from, well, apart from birds, if you're walking in a forest, um, the birds are very present. And, and I think probably for lots of musicians, birds are a great inspiration. And I certainly found that when I was working on the White Storks piece, just their, um, their character is, is very, um, it's very well drawn with the white stalks. They have very definite, very distinctive habits and characteristics and behaviours. But even through lockdown, sitting in the garden, listening to the, the blue tits and the blackbirds, um, I've got to know a little bit more about how the birds behave and, um, and have felt much closer to nature. And I, I wrote a little piece in um, during lockdown on my musical box that was um, trying to copy the sound of the blackbird. That we we lived with a blackbird for a couple of months. It sang ceaselessly, and that was wonderful. Thank you. That's very beautiful. Thanks for sharing this uh, intimate experience. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to give a bit of feedback that I think your music is really beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. And I love the well, fact that you. it involves, <laughs> you're very welcome. I love the fact that it involves the chants and the movement and the, you know, the shoes and all, all the different things that come into it. I found it really inspiring. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. That was a really that was a really long time ago. So I don't know. Do do have a look at um, some of the more recent work on the on the links and 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 I hope you still like those pieces too. I don't think I don't not sure that I've changed that much. I I really recognise my, myself in that piece. I must say. <laughs> <laughs> I will listen. Thank you. <laughs> um, Esha, please, you had a uh, something to say. Oh, well, after that, I don't know. Um, I was just going to ask about um, what's the role for you of notation? I'm thinking again about movement and how we capture it in some way to reproduce or maybe not. Maybe it is, all, you know, if you're working with chance, but um, um, how much do you, I mean, if you were composing at the piano, were you then writing things down quite specifically or or um, is that too sort of too fixed? No, I think I do do that. I think I write a special, I, I don't know if this is something to, to do with getting older, but I find I have to write it down absolutely straight away. Otherwise it's just gone. And then I have to think of something else. And um, I don't know whether it's something to do with the, the small screen age, but I find that I can't hold something in my mind for very long sometimes. And so I, I do have a little bit of an urgency to get things down on paper. Um, so I'm a bit frantic sometimes. Don't you sometimes. use voice memos? Don't you so use voice again? memos on your phone? Don't you use oh, voice well, memos could. on your phone? No, I don't. I should, shouldn't I? <laughs> you know, I, I? When I walk, I always have my phone ready to so that I get a lot of ideas, sketches. <laughs> uh, so oh, a lot of my recordings have got traffic or birds in the background um, you're not the greatest recordings but because it's when you're walking it's a bit uneven usually but yeah <laughs> I find walking does trigger ideas and, and now you it have does with me as well when you, you've got now you've got rhythm as you're as you're walking haven't you you've got um I do sometimes when I'm driving as well some things come into my head that experience of trying to keep a tune in your head while you're driving, you've still got another 50 miles to go and you're trying not to forget it. 
singing over and over. So voice recorder, yes. Good idea. You know, with movement, with movement, um, I started off talking about Bonnie Bird um, and the Laban Center. Well, Laban um, invented notation for movement. I don't know very much about it, but Laban notation notates movement. Yes, that's right. Um, I was just I wondering think your Asha work. I made a yes. point about this in the chat. Mm -hmm. Oh, Sorry, well, I was just describing an idea I had when I was at Trinity Laban and they had just joined. And I thought I knew about Laban notation because my mother studied it a bit. And and I knew that it's not just writing down the steps, that there's something about movement qualities or expressive qualities. And here I am doing some a movement. Um, <laughs> And so I thought, it's quite well, often you used know, by, um, yeah, it's, it's often used by actors as well, Isha. Oh, is it? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah to, so to I thought, character. well, you know, in, sorry, go ahead. Oh, so in character, in character there. development, so it's about lightness and, you know, and weight and um, where you leave, where the body leads from and so on. It's an extremely useful set of uh, tool, it's a fantastic tool, actually. That's very interesting. My My idea was, Tying into, I mentioned this idea about what metaphors do music directors or teachers use when they're trying to get an expressive effect. I thought, well, they each have to make up their own. And have they ever applied a system like, you know, could Laban notation apply to this slightly more abstract sense of movement we get from music, um, even without looking at the musicians who, of course, are moving. But, you know, we have a lot of feeling of movement in music. So, but I didn't get to finish the project. As I say, they weren't quite ready for, well, the, the music people thought it was great. The dance people thought I should stay in, on the music side, but that was a decade <laughs> ago. So who knows uh -oh. now? <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. And Andrew said in the chat, maybe to invite someone from Laban to a walk, listen cafe to explore it further. That would be very interesting. That would be a very good idea. Yes. Oh, yes, good idea, yeah. Andrew. The whole topic about walking scores, lots of artists, walking artists, walking creatives work uh, with scoring um, walks, which are actually not meant as musical scores, but as sort of movement or memory scores. So to bring together some approaches about that um, could extend this conversation. A lot of a lot of my um, early work was with the Romba Dance Company, and I used to sit in the in the auditorium um, and do with a torch um, and do um, my own line drawing of the choreography, which which um, were were kind of um, mind photographs in a way. Um, uh, so that's. That's in a way what what got me into movement and and into music as well. And I have one of those, Barry. I think <laughs> you do. I think <laughs> <laughs> yes. There were a lot of them, Helen. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't was... make it any more valuable. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. But. Um, some of them were done as scores, really, where where I used an A4 sheet instead of an A3, A5 sheet, um, and then and then um, it was like a cartoon strip, really. Yeah. Um, so I worked quite fast uh, with a rotary pen, believe it or not, which is the slowest instrument you could possibly use. <laughs> yeah. I just want to say I'm really sorry about my disappearance. Andrew did say in on social media in a tweet the other day something about my mysterious disappearances. And lo and <laughs> behold, I did them. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. It's been a wonderful talk, Helen. Very, very good indeed. Very, very good. Thank you, Barry. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I must say it's really it's really useful having these opportunities. I'm, I'm sure that people who work in academia, um, you know, they're probably quite blasé about this kind of thing. But when you get the chance to to kind of address 
something in your work in in terms of a presentation or a talk or or a piece of writing it's it's really valuable for putting things together in your mind um and i found it really good the last couple of years when i've, I've done a few talks it was the same when i did um i did a presentation for a, a death conference at bath university and and i found i i sort of remembered that I've written an awful lot of music about loss, but if you'd asked me before I started putting together the presentation, I wouldn't have said that was the case. So somehow this kind of exploring your own work brings up these these threads, which I, which I find really useful for the future, I think. So thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. Well, isn't it really Just like please. another? Yes. Sorry. Yes, please, I should. I just, it's, it's like another format. I mean, as with collaborating with writers and dancers and and painters, and so you're 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 now bouncing off of this this giving a talk format and informing your work yeah. that way. Yeah, yeah. But it's kind of new for me. <laughs> but very good. Uh, uh, once more, thank you, Helen, uh, for sharing your <laughs> ideas and uh, giving, uh, creating this opportunity to talk all of us. I'll um, uh, hope you enjoyed it all. Uh, please be invited to uh, give your comment feedback uh, on the site. And um, a good evening. <laughs>